I wasn't in the rap game I probably have a key knee deep in the crack game Because the streets is a short stop Either you're slinging crack rock or you got a wicked jump shot How'd you get into like the line officer aspect? How'd you even get into that? So actually, it was funny. Uh, I went to at first I was outside sales. Um, then I got recruited by a company called New Day, mm -hmm. New Day USA. Went there, loved it. Um, stayed there for a year. Um, it was like a um, more of a uh, salary plus commission type type spot. Then I just took a bet on myself and just moved on to a uh, company called Goldwater. Yeah, that first home, mm -hmm. like 100% commission. Mm -hmm. um, five days, trying to generate business with their uh -huh. own tears. Yeah, we're going to get into, um, into the commission aspect in a little bit for sure. Uh, Leah, how about, you? how about yourself? Um, yeah, so I'm a realtor. Um, especially before, but I've started working off kind of on the investment side. So I came home, um, I was a college athlete. So the money that my parents had saved, for college, I kind of used that to buy my first house, and then from there, kind of like Blake was saying, use that to kind of pull it to the next house, the next house. Um, did a flip in between, um, and kind of did that BRR method, which maybe we'll touch on, um, and just use money, equity, and building the other houses to go to the next house. From there, I got with a good realtor. She mentored me, and I decided to just go ahead and get my license. Um, at first, just to kind of put out the middle man for flips that I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And it ended up being like pretty cool. Like, I could make more money on one deal than I make them work on my job. So, here I am. What about you, bro? So, for me, H2 Design Build is a family company. Um, so, the development aspect of my uh, effect of real estate was family. Mm -hmm. That's what got me into it. Um, with H2 doing development project management. Uh, basically what I do is just facilitating getting the project from uh, the dirt to being sold. And then it made um, good sense for me to go ahead and get my license because I could then have my hand in multiple parts of the transaction with our development, which would be to do the development, project management, and the sales. Mm -hmm. I'm a dual career agent, so I guess by definition, for the folks that don't know, I work a full-time job. I do real estate on the side. So I think I would say one of the main things that I love about real estate is there's so many different ways that you can make money in, mm -hmm. right? You know, you can, you have the development side, you have the lending side, you have wholesaling, you have, I mean, there's so many ways that you can make money depending on how much time, money, effort you want to put into it. So I would say, like I said in the beginning, most people, you know, with the average home price being in D.C. what it is, you can make more money on one deal than you make on your job. So getting a license, what, $300, $250, something like that, could have, even if you do one deal per quarter, you're making, I don't know, 2,000 times the money you put out, mm -hmm. if not more. So I think it's something for somebody exactly, like you said, they may have more responsibilities at home or... They may have, you know, a new baby or, or you know, something like that. Or may not be able to afford Or may not be able to afford college. But it's a low cost of entry, mm -hmm. high return industry. I don't really know anything else like it besides drugs. Yeah. But, <laughs> we don't want to advise that. We don't want to advise that, obviously. Yeah. Right, I can That's legal hustle. Awesome. I can piggyback on that. So I think a lot of people think just real tip when they think of real estate. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because a lot of people contact me, they don't know what a loan officer exactly does, mm -hmm. they don't know the process, any of that. But not only just a loan officer, there's so many people that get paid from a real estate transaction. You got an appraiser, you got uh, working at the title company, you got um, a home inspector. You know what I mean? So many different ways that you can, and you can get into and make money from, you know, a real estate transaction. So out of those different positions, if I'm understanding correctly, like they don't require a certain level of formal education, right? Like of course you gotta take your classes in order to get licensed. So a appraiser, they basically work, they basically, it's like almost like a mentorship type. Mm -hmm. They have to work under an appraiser for a certain amount of time and you're helping them with appraisers. And then after a certain season, a time you can now become your own appraiser. Right. So like my company, we hire our own appraisers. So mm -hmm. we have five appraisers. Mm -hmm. with us. We appraise was five fifty. Each appraiser makes like three fifty per per house they do. They mm -hmm. might do two, three houses a day. You know what I mean? They might be doing fifteen houses a week that they appraise, making three fifty a pop for each one. Mm -hmm. So that'd be a six figure gig. I, I, I can't do that math in my yeah, head. That'd be a six figure gig. That'd be a six figure gig if you if you uh, 
but that's not something that's glorified as even right. promoted to get into that field. You know what I mean? You're coming up as a young and has no idea what the hell an appraiser is. Yeah. 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 No, it's no idea like, how much you can make off of that. Yeah, doing so, a home inspector. Same, same thing. thing. Yeah. And anybody yeah. can be a home inspector, right? Um, and you do as have to do certain licenses and uh-huh. stuff like that, but you don't have to have a college education and things that sort. But yeah, they're getting four fifty per home inspection. Right. You know what I mean? So they're doing multiple home inspections a week. Mm-hmm. So that's just another another line of work that you can right. to get into. I know um Blake, I've known that like your father has been involved in real estate for a while, like flipping properties and um doing construction. Uh how like how does that work and how does somebody even get into that aspect um, of dealing with properties. And, you know. Well, the thing I see is a lot of people think the HGTV, a lot of people, they've seen me flip, flip a house. They say, mm-hmm. oh, I want to flip a house, I'm going to put some money into it. And it's it's tougher than most people mm-hmm. think. I think what's interesting and like part of what I love about doing these is that, um, that all of us are former athletes. Uh, so Blake, man, I've known you since, I was Probably nine or ten years old mm-hmm. on the Bowie football fields, Twana, I know you since middle school, uh, Landon in St. Albans, and uh, Leah, I know you since high school. Um, so, just like with, with our athletic background, each of us playing um, college sports at that, um, to be fortunate enough, I want y'all to share a little bit um, just about like your athletic experience in college, um, but also how being a former athlete has helped you succeed in a tough industry, um, you know, with real estate being competitive and being seasonal and having trends and, you know, just elaborate on like your background as a, as a, as an athlete and how it's been for you. Start, I'll start. Um, I played football in college. I um, went to school in Rhode Island. Don't no, advise anyone to go to school in Rhode Island. You don't have a legit, like, reason to go there. <laughs> But yeah, my college football career was cut short. So my ACL had two shoulder surgeries on my robot. It was over for me with sports. But what sports definitely taught me was um, one, how to be disciplined. You have to be on time. You got to be punctual. It's similar to like the military. If you think about it, and it's also similar to a job mm-hmm. when you're in college. So of course, having that responsibility at a young age, you're 18, 19, 20, you're still developing. You're still your brain still growing. You're trying to figure out things and put things in perspective. Having that intense responsibility, I think, makes work easy. So for me, work is extremely easy because I've had to take steps for overcome uh, obstacles in the field or in training or in film study that I didn't think I would be able to do. And once I was able to get over that hump or or achieve a feat that I didn't think I was going to be able to do in that arena, it made problem solving and work like sweet. Mm-hmm. What you uh, heard about you play? So pretty much how it worked, like you were saying, you know, um, you know, definitely had to be able to be a part of a team of a short, um, you know, work with other people. Um, it's definitely giving me some resiliency because jumping into, for instance, like coordination with basketball, you know what I mean? You might, it might not go your way. You might not be playing. You guys might be losing. I mean, it's kind of similar in the same in this mm-hmm. field where it's like when I first started 100% condition, it was a slow burn. Like you had to put in the work. Like it was like going into the gym where you're not in practice. You got to stay in office late. You got to do those things to kind of build your funnel, build your pipeline. And it took a few years for, you know, for everything to come to fruition. Mm-hmm. And people see the end result, right. you know what I mean? But they don't see what you're doing behind the scenes. You going in the gym, shooting a thousand jump shots, doing all the other different things. So it definitely helped me from that perspective to really learn and put in the work and really stay true to the ground, stay the course. Mm-hmm. And that thing is just going to happen over the future. I plan to, uh, to get into that, but since you touched on it a little bit already, um, just now, I want you to uh, elaborate, like, what you mean, like, when you say, like, when you first started off, like, that slow grind, um, mm-hmm. being 100% commission, like, how, you know, elaborate on that a little bit, like. Um, I mean, shit, being 100% commission, tough, so, I mean, you like, when you first get into the business, you got to be a pilot, so, mm-hmm. when you first get into the business, you're not going to just have clients, just, right, off the of and this is a transaction that is, the most important transaction to somebody. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know what I mean? They want to know, they want to know that they can trust you with this transaction. Mm-hmm. So, 
you have to not only that, you gotta brand yourself behind that because for a while people just knew me as Blake who played basketball. Facts. Or Blake who did parties. Yeah, you know yeah, what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah. So they didn't associate me with, you know, being real estate. So that's mm-hmm. what made me start marketing myself more on social media to now build a brand behind yeah, myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Instead of just posting regular pictures, mm-hmm. they don't even know I'm alone now for sure. <laughs> right, 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 right. You know what I mean? So that's what made me kind of do that. So, I mean, those first couple. Shit, year or two, you might, you know, you won't close deals here and there, but if that part not starts to grow, then it starts to all come at once. Mm-hmm. You know I mean? So, and that's just what happened for me over this past year. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm like top 20 in my company. But yeah, it's like following you on, on the brand now. Like, you see, like, it's like you, you closing with deals like every day. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just think, I think like that's just, it's as important for people to know. That, that don't just happen overnight. Like the same with like playing ball. Like that don't just happen. You feel me? You go to a game and whoever they averaging twenty. Like man, shorty ain't start off averaging twenty like that. Exactly. Right? Ain't even start off getting five minutes a game. Exactly. Um, so it's like with you, you know, performing at the rate that you're performing now. Like it's, I think it's equally important to know. Like man, when you start out, like you're gonna take some some tough months. Like <laughs> you're gonna be checking your account. Like exactly. all right. This ain't come through. That ain't come. You gonna take some losses. Um, so I think that's like equally important to uh, to share. What uh, what about yourself? Yeah. Um, so I play tennis, so it's kind of like less intense. Less intense. <laughs> <laughs> less definitely. I wouldn't say less intense. Yeah, that's why I wouldn't say necessarily. Well, I'm happy to hear y'all say that most people don't think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, it's kind of like when you come from like your hometown and you're the best player in your hometown, mm-hmm. but you get to college and everybody was the best player in their hometown. Mm-hmm. And I liken that to real estate because basically every day you're going out and auditioning for these clients. Yeah. So when the lead comes through these lead generation things that we all have access to, it's not just coming to me. Right. So Bob is calling her, Lisa's calling her, Leah is calling her. So I have to prove like why I'm the best. And I, I know I'm the best, right? I'm, I'm, believe in myself, but you have to make them believe that. So they may as well be the coach in the situation how I look at it. Um, and that's why you talk about like the job and preparation for a job. I also think like that prepares you for like no matter what job you have, not just this. I think that going in and having to prove yourself every day, having other people who are just as good as you and like helping people understand like the unique value that you bring. Mm-hmm. I think sports helps you do that. And, you know, something else I think is being able to humble yourself mm-hmm. and find somebody who may be in a position that you want to be in and humbling yourself and going to them and asking like, hey, like, what worked for you? So probably like, you know, that might be your freshman and senior on the team. If he's a starting point guard, they bring you in as a recruit to, you know, take his spot when he graduates. Like, bro, what did you do? Mm-hmm. Since what did you do? Mm-hmm. That may be an extra lifting session. That may be an extra hitting session in my but just humbling yourself enough that like it's enough out here for everybody to eat. Right. You don't have to be star all the time. So learn what you can from the person that's successfully doing it already. Take that, apply some of it, leave some of it, put some of your stuff in the mix, and that's a good recipe for success, I think. No, definitely. I think uh and y'all can chime in and give your give your opinion. But me personally, I feel like the real estate industry, at least from the realtor perspective. And because of like what you just mentioned about pretty much like auditioning yourself to um, to different prospective clients, I think it's so competitive and that it's it presents such challenges that I feel like unless you have a mentor, you damn near trying to climb a vertical cliff, like a vertical mountain, unless you got a mentor to guide you through and feed you the ins and outs and show you, you know, how to really succeed in the game. I don't know if y'all agree. If, if we talked about this. Like, when you first told me you were getting your license, that was mm-hmm. one of the first things I think I mentioned to you. I was like, you need to make sure that you kind of have someone to show you what's going on. So I'm going to mentor. The classes don't teach you. And that's, and that's with the classes. That's with that's taking. Like, it's yeah. like college. Yeah, it's it's how much how much mm-hmm. you are in school you actually use on a day-to-day basis on your job. It's not applicable. It's, it's, just, it's just a foundation rule. What's like a typical stretch for somebody that's a beginner in the real estate industry? A typical common stretch for them to go like without seeing any money, like without seeing any income. They're doing to the day. Depends on the situation. Um, 
It depends on the situation. I'm not saying like for extreme, but just like like your like your average. I'd like probably say I say more beat, I see realtors. Probably I'll say maybe a year. I look at I look at the real estate game kinda as like a wake up now or mm-hmm. five weeks or something mm-hmm. like that. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay. Okay. It don't cost you a lot to get into it. Mm-hmm. So you see, and then you see the finished product. So that guy who came to you at Wake Up Now, he's telling you how much money he had made on Wake Up Now. He put nothing on you, he just put a new outlet. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? You only got to pay $200 to get in, and that's all you got to do. Mm-hmm. But he ain't showing you that he been in it for two years, and he didn't spoke at a thousand different meetings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. You know what I mean? Or to get to clean the floor, to get a project done, and go yeah. in and meet with an investor. You know what I'm saying? It's just like a back of work. So they see, they see the finished product. But so they think they can come in and just recreate that and mm-hmm. put in work because they don't they didn't see the work you put in on the back end. You know what I'm saying? So now once they get in and see what they really have to do, there's gonna be a slow grind. You know what I mean? Now they all right, let me let me go back to my job. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm gonna get my license and I'm gonna sell a house. Like right. you come in, I got a license. The house is gonna get sold. Mm-hmm. Exactly. I don't have to worry about an appraisal matching the buyer's purchase <laughs> price. I don't have to worry about the home inspection yeah. coming back and the, the seller said that they're not taking care of these items that are flawed in this mechanical system. You don't know none of that stuff. Right, 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 right. So that's that touching base on what we talking about before. It's just it's there's elements of I think every profession that are not going to be broadcast in the front. Think about, I guess, those sacrifices that you got to make in a real estate game. Um, Because again, like different from some industries or some career paths where you don't really have like outside uh, influences or things on the the exterior that can affect like your day-to-day work and your schedule. Like some people, you might have a straight nine to five, Monday through Friday, no fluctuation, no variance, et cetera, et cetera. But if you've got clients, you kind of got to go like with the way that they go, depending on what their availability is, um, or they might have a different type of alternate work schedule where you, as a door agent, you might work during the day, but you might have a client that works at night. Or, you know, you might have a client where your days are open on weekends, you're most available on weekends, but they work weekends. Um, so have y'all ever encountered certain challenges where it's like you might even you might even like lose out on some money or a deal or a client due to just like the demands on, on your time or their time, et cetera? I haven't lost a client per se from a situation like that, mm-hmm. but it's definitely something that you'll have to accommodate often. Mm-hmm. So the schedules will not always match up. You won't always be convenient, but when you have to do work, there are no real guidelines for time of work. Mm-hmm. You'll have someone who wants to finish a transaction, you and another agent, and it might be midnight that you're sending back paperwork to DocuSign. Mm-hmm. So the discipline aspect of it mm-hmm. in terms of making sure that you get what you need to do done, however fast that needs to be done, is kind of on you. Mm-hmm. And it's going to vary, uh, I guess, probably per transaction and mm-hmm. per client. That's another thing. Dealing with different personalities. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. You don't know what type of person you're really going to deal with from that first interaction. You go show someone a house, everything's nice, we all chilling, this is so nice. Mm-hmm. And then you get to them finances, mm-hmm. and then you get to this paperwork, and then you really see, you know, what type of person you're dealing with. Mm-hmm. And you'll have to make, um, we talk about sacrifice, you have to make some sacrifice, you have to make some adjustments, and you probably have to bend over a little bit mm-hmm. to, to make some transactions go through. Mm-hmm. What about, um, like, what about, just like the professional side of being a real estate like that and dealing with different personalities um, and just like being able to handle that. And I attribute like to what you just said, Tom, about um, like different personalities uh, with your clients. It's kind of just like like leadership style. It's like to be an effective leader, like you gotta be able to lead people with different personalities and that are receptive to different styles of leadership. Like if you just, if you just got one style that you operate when you're leading, like you're not going to be as effective because everybody isn't isn't receptive to the same type of leadership style. So, like if you're in the real estate game and you got different clients, like you might got your picky clients, you might got your easy going clients, and then you know, like once you say it, once you start preparing for the settlement table, and then they want you to make certain exceptions, or they might want you to bend over backwards, they might want you to break some rules a little bit. Um, what are some of those challenges like? Real estate is the highest paying retail in your life. 
That's what I bring them. And when I say that, I mean it's no different from working at McDonald's or the clothing store or anything else. Like mm-hmm. people are coming to you to get a product that only you can provide. Like they came in the Old Navy to get a shirt from Old Navy. So the only place they can get an Old Navy shirt is from Old Navy. So they're coming to you to buy a house. You're not the only person, but they chose you. That's like that's at this point they've chosen you. So it's like you kind of have to accommodate them. It's pretty much whatever they want, unless it comes mm-hmm. as something that's like against something ethical or what you like, you know, if they're racist or something like that, you're pretty much doing whatever it is to keep them as a client. So I don't, I don't think it's any different from like a retail job that you worked at as a kid in high school, besides the fact that in, at the end of it, you'll make a lot more money. Mm-hmm. It's, that's what it comes down to for me. But also with that, like you have to set your own parameters. Like when it's family time, it's family time. Mm-hmm. When it's time to shut it down, it's time to shut it down because if you let them, they will work they here. They mess out of you. All through the night. Yeah. Like my phone goes off at 10. My philosophy is whatever doesn't happen by 10 p.m., it's not going to make a difference if it happens at 6 a.m. when I wake up. Mm-hmm. That's what I don't have kids, but I have a new husband. And that's one of the challenges is like I'm always with my phone. I don't go anywhere without my phone. Mm-hmm. On vacation, I'm like trying to find Wi Fi. Mm-hmm. So you just kind of have to understand that people who aren't in this don't necessarily understand the attachment. So you have to. A, help them understand, but B, also set expectations with your clients from the beginning. These are times I'm available. These are times I'm not available. And stay mm-hmm. firm in it. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, and, and mine, mine is a little different. So, like, once they find a house, their side isn't done, but they're kind of more in the background. Whereas mine, I got 30 days of this thing has to go to close. Mm-hmm. I got to do everything. And I they affect your money, too, because they need to move expeditiously. Yeah, they, 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 might be, they might be selling the house, mm-hmm. then they got to be out of too, and they buy another house. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So, or the seller might not be waiting, or the seller's on the, on the deal. Like, yeah. They have to get out of their house and things of that sort. So, and I'll go on vacation. Uh, you see, I go on vacation quite often, but I got to be on my laptop. I got to be accessible. Um, because right, right, right. Cause you will get you don't stop. My and you got a business relationship. So if I'm an agent and you are my my loan officer, and I'm like, damn, and where's the that and I'm trying to get this bread. I'm trying to get this bread room where you need it. You know, right, I need that. You need that bread room because all of us are due by five. It's three. Yeah, I'm in Miami. I still got to be accessible. Right, to get that done. So pretty much for me. Uh, I might give calls to my realtors at 11. Look, we just talked to the listeners. We're going to run the deal. I need you to run the numbers on this. Mm-hmm. Boom, it's 11 o'clock. I might be in the bed. I have a problem with my laptop. So, me, I'm, and another thing they didn't kind of touch on, like, you almost become like a therapist in those type of deals. Where you I've heard about that as well. You talk about family they, stuff. They talk about so much of their personal stuff, then they start. Yeah, that's the, that's the, that's that's really I'm taking this to everything. Yeah, right, 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 right. That's the most important part. Yeah, yeah. I'm right. right. taking it to everything. So if, we, if you got a divorce, I need to see your divorce decree. I need to know the terms. I'm looking at your bank statements, child support. I'm, I know your whole situation. <laughs> yeah. So you got to talk to me intimately about these things so I can make sure that there isn't anything that hasn't been uncovered that could kill the deal. Done. Right, so, right. You know what I mean? So, and that's an interesting thing that you mentioned right there too, like how something at the very end to kill the whole deal and kill all the work that you're gonna put in for not even just the past thirty days, but that's the work that you can you could have been putting in for the last two, three, up to six months or whatever, you know what I mean, preparing this person to buy a house. Those are the ones that hit do me, yeah, the agent yeah. and the loan officer, the folks that go buy furniture yeah. for their new house when you told them not to do it. Or they buy a car or something. <laughs> something yeah. yeah. Exactly. Um, I was thinking, of, and Blake, we've talked about this before, or at least like you mentioned some of it here on Instagram or Twitter. Um, what What have you learned being a loan officer? Um, just about, I mean, we're going to keep it frank, just about like financially from in, in, in the black community, um, some things that we could improve upon um, to, to just put ourselves in a better position financially. Um, ultimately for home ownership, but just in general, just like financial awareness um, and wealth accumulation. Um, well, one of the biggest things I'm gonna say, I think it starts from parenting, mm-hmm. because like 
So I'll get my clients of other races. Mm. Most of the, most of those kids are like millennials are younger, but they are on two authorized cards mm-hmm. on their parents that have good credit, have good things. So their parents have been helping them build credit for X amount of time. Yeah, okay, so so a lot of those people have come to it, come to it. And then they also most of the time when I see good credit scores, they also have good savings. Mm-hmm. So you know what I mean they're not blowing through their money, they're paying their bills on time. It's just everybody knows they're supposed to do it, but you know, and I I have friends that do it, mm-hmm. get a check and they go straight to Gucci and, mm-hmm. and spend outside of their means and not taking care of the priorities first. Right. You know, living for fun first. But yeah, I would say that's the biggest thing. I think just the education that be staying part of just educating people on how to build credit. There's so many people that I talk to every day that don't know they need to keep their credit card balances below 30%. Mm-hmm. Or they don't even know what to do or how to go about, you know, keeping their credit up. You know what I mean? I get a lot. I, I pull out a lot of credit. A lot no question. Of a ton. And, and I get probably, I would say 50% of mine are under 600. Mm-hmm. 50%. Yeah, 50% of the credit I pull is under. And, and you could be a, a high earner. You could be making six figures. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And yeah. 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 But, but, that's what I, but that's why I also think that people in the, like people in the street, when I say people in the street, I mean like buyers and folks trying to get yeah, uh, uh, into real estate, they don't understand that just because you make a lot of money, just because your income is high, if your credit score is low or if your debt to income ratio that's is jacked up. Thing. I hear so many people talk about, oh, I got to wait till I make more money or mm-hmm. I don't make enough money. It's not about how much money you make. It's about your debt that you've accumulated. Mm-hmm. I have clients that might make 150 but qualify for the same thing that the person that made 50000 qualified for. Okay, so I'll let, explain that. Like, so, how, how if you got, just so they're saying is, you know, as you make more money, more bills come with it. Mm-hmm. So you start, so when you, you make 150 your car goes higher. Yeah, you know, <laughs> The, the exactly. So now your bills are higher. So now your debt to income ratio is the same as the person who made fifty thousand because they're driving a cheaper car. Right. They're you know they don't have the big credit card limit that you right. have. So maybe you did have the big credit card limit for twenty thousand on it, but you undisciplined with your credit cards. So now you got mm-hmm. fifteen thousand on it. Well, you got an MX that's maxed out. You know what I mean? So it's a lot of different things. Like for instance, I just had a client that made hundred eighty thousand, probably got like a hundred thousand in revolving debt. But why? Why do you have a hundred thousand in revolving debt? That was scary. And you make a hundred <laughs> but you make a hundred and eighty thousand. Why are you spending money on credit? Why are you not spending the money that you actually making? Your bills aren't even mm-hmm. that much. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? But I go through bank statements, you'll see spending habits, you know, people it up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's crazy, but that's one of the biggest things you just learn how to, you know what I mean? Like, really be fi- financially conscious on what you're trying to achieve long term as opposed to in the moment. All mm-hmm. the things that depreciate over time and things of that sort. What is, it that, uh, what is it that you all preach to our peers or prospective uh, buyers or even prospective investors? Um, like just to help the public understand why it's important to to own property. To me, I think home ownership is probably the easiest way to accumulate a lot of wealth. Mm-hmm. Um, we were talking about it earlier when you purchase a home, it's probably the most money you'll ever spend. The yeah, biggest transaction. Yeah, that's the most expensive. You're, you're not making a purchase anywhere near as, as much as a, as a home is going to be. Um, but within that, that also means that most of your expenditures, if you're not a homeowner, go towards your house. So it's kind of like a, a balance between those two things for me. If you're spending most of your money on where you live at and you're not gaining anything from that, mm-hmm. then to make a purchase that would kind of, you could say somewhat alleviate those costs because you have equity involved in your expenditure now where you live at, it, it, it only makes sense. Mm-hmm. It only makes sense. And then you get to a place where you're on the upside or you're in the green where you have equity that's higher than what you owe on your loan. And you can make moves with that. Mm-hmm. I think it's the easiest way to accumulate wealth. It's 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 not about how much money you make. It's mm-hmm. how much how much money you have, mm-hmm. right? Which is assets and, and investments mm-hmm. and portfolios and things like that. I mean, you've like had had a good a good amount of experience on the investor side. Uh, can you speak a little bit about it? Um, just 
why that's such an attractive market, why the real estate industry is attractive the way it is for investments. And when I say that, I'm getting to like a lot of entertainers or athletes or just uh, people with nice cash flow in general. Um, you know, they they they're attracted to real estate investments. And you can obviously um, you can invest in stocks, you can invest in bonds, and you can invest in all types of different things. But why real estate? Um, so my dad, when I was younger, taught me four things simple. So tax benefits mm -hmm. is one. Um, the second one is eventually we're going to run out of land. It's a commodity. So mm -hmm. eventually one day, maybe we won't be here to see it. There's not going to be any more land. So monopoly is like a real thing. Right. Buy what you can. The third thing is legacy. And kind of what you were speaking on, like historically in current day, it's like if it wasn't beneficial and couldn't help us, then whoever, I'm not going to say what group of people, wouldn't have tried so hard to stop us from having it. Right. So, you know, look at drugs. They put drugs in our community. It's not good for us. They didn't let us buy houses. They didn't let us get commercial loans to build multi-unit buildings. They didn't let us do a lot of that stuff. They didn't give the, the war veterans GI bills, you know, to buy houses when they came back home from the war. So, if a group of people, doesn't matter the color, is trying really hard to keep you out of something, it's probably something you want to look into a little bit more mm -hmm. because it's a reason why they want to keep it from themselves. Mm -hmm. So in terms of me and the investor thing, it's like my parents didn't really make that much money, but they were able to, you know, give my siblings and I experiences based on a property that my dad bought in like the late 70s. Mm -hmm. Bought it, lived in it, moved, and it's had the same tenant in there for 30 years. Mm -hmm. That put me through private school, you know, put me, put my siblings through college. And so I kind of saw that and was like, this is cool. And so my investment strategy, if you can even call it that, is I like super urban environments. Mm -hmm. The worse the neighborhood, the more I like it. Because eventually it's going to turn. There's going to be no more land. So they're going to have to eventually, you know, work with that and be people have that runner's mentality that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. And not that I'm praying on people, but if I have a product and you're a buyer, yeah. then I'm going to have what they need. Real estate is legal drug dealing. It's mm -hmm. just what it is. Mm -hmm. And everybody needs it. Everybody, yeah. everybody needs it. It's the one industry you guys never learned that. You have to, people have to buy. It's a necessity market. It's a necessity market. A necessity market. So, so many people get paid off of it. The reason the recession happened was because of the real estate market. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So they they can't allow this industry to fail because the market fails, the country fails. So at the end of the day, this is something that's going to forever flourish, forever. You know what I mean? So that I mean that's why you get into investments and things of that sort for sure. And it's going to be the folks like you said that have the savings and the credit that when the market does crash again, because it is, it's going to come and scoop everything up. It's like monopoly. Exactly. The person that is, you know, real conservative at the beginning of the game, when those people start going around the board and laying it on going to jail, they're like, all right, y'all at Park Place, let me buy them for $100. Exactly. They have no choice but to sell it to you because they need money to keep playing the game. Mm -hmm. it's, that's the most real life game there is. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I had young children, I'd be, like, we would be playing that from the time they could comprehend. That is life. And it's life on the board. I, so I think these are around. conversations that more of us need to have. Yeah. Yeah. You feel what I'm saying? Like, and they yeah. gotta start younger. They gotta yeah. start young. Like imagine knowing what we know now. Imagine yeah. like having them conversations and knowing that like early on, like right. 20, 21, and you know, you know what I mean? You the same way we can be like, oh yeah, then, you know, those are Jordan 16 player editions. Mm -hmm. If we took that part of our brain, remember the rap songs, the mm -hmm. go-go hooks, the Jordans, the clothes and all that stuff and just apply even a little bit of that right. to some of the stuff, we would be so much better off. But I would say read and like don't mess up your credit. Mm -hmm. Like that that's the biggest thing. The biggest hurdle is like we we were, yeah, we, we, were, we were in space. We were in spaces where our parents allowed us to have opportunities to go to these great schools that you mentioned earlier and things, albeit the athlete or they were paying for it, but you have to build off that. Mm -hmm. Like, you can't just go and be like, all right, now I'm about to go get this $10,000 refund and go with Gucci and get fly for spring break. Right. Like, you got to, there has to be like an end game, like mm -hmm. you said. So, 
lots of people, go to college, get good jobs, make a lot of money, and got a whole bunch of debt. They're broke. Yeah. Like straight up. I mean, that's not even. If you make a lot of money <laughs> and you have a lot of debt, you don't have no money. Exactly. Because you owe somebody. Yeah. That much money. Exactly. And it's even more personal for me because I kind of went through that. I came out of school and was kind of like chasing all the stuff that I didn't have. Mm -hmm. And I saw like, you know, where I am now, I'm probably ahead of most people, but I think how much further I could have been ahead mm -hmm. if I would have came out of school and been like, damn, like my parents bought me a house. Mm -hmm. What? <laughs> like, if I would have been saving the money that my friends were spending on rent, even a thousand dollars a month, mm -hmm. you know how much money I have in the bank now, five years later? So to the young people, like you're saying, siblings, cousins, Mental mentees, save your money. These mm -hmm. Jordans gonna come back out. Sabiato still up Georgetown. It's the same stuff. <laughs> it's the same stuff coming back around. Yeah, I think um, what's dope is that each of you, like, you got hip to the real estate game because um, your family was involved, um, and you got an early look at real estate and investing and ownership from from early age so essentially like you kind of got a head start um which you know explains like why y'all are at where you're at now um but i think that type of exposure is like it's so necessary i mean we've been talking about it but it's so necessary and so important like for folks in our communities to get that type of that same type of exposure at a younger age um because i mean as you know as we explained i mean it doesn't require a high level of education. Um, you don't have to graduate at the top of your class or anything like that. You really just gotta have work ethic, some discipline and some, some tough skin to go through, you know, the ups and downs and to go through that initial bumpy road before it smoothens out um, and you can like sail off into the sunset basically.